speaker joining us today is the deputy editorial director at BuzzFeed. His work is focused on pop culture and viral content. Adweek's list of 50 people has him on it for those who are making the machinery of media. And Business Week refers to him as the man who's cracked the code. Now, he's here today to share with us his journey of what happens when your iPhone is stolen from a bar in NYC and you go to China to retrieve it. I know there's a lot in the middle that he's going to fill the gaps in, so please join me in welcoming Matt Stapera. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's see if this presentation will go. Um, so I'm actually here. It's funny that I'm here in the first place to begin with. I'm here for the dumbest reason ever. Uh, I'm here because of this cell phone right here. Um, this cell phone became so much more than a cell phone. It became like a golden ticket to like this crazy adventure, something that you couldn't even ever make up. Um, and I'm going to tell you the story about this, basically. Um, so this crazy thing happened to me, and it started at this bar in uh, last year. I was sitting in the bar, and I put my phone on the table, and I look up, and the phone's gone. So I do what anyone, do anyone does in that situation. I turn up the whole bar, make everyone look in their pockets, look in their pocketbooks, see if where it is. Uh, of course, I call it, and it goes straight to voicemail, uh, which, as you guys know, is the international sign of phone death. Um, and I know what you're thinking. It's like, oh, you must have been really drunk. And I swear to you, I wasn't that drunk. It was just there was a really smart criminal who came in and just knew that he could just come in and swipe the phone off the table. So, every th so the next day, I go out, and I buy a new phone because I can't live without my cell phone. And everything's normal. Months pass, and I'm sitting on the couch, and I'm doing as I do, you know, looking for something to Instagram, uh, post on Facebook, stuff like that, when I'm going through my photo stream. And in my photo stream, I see these weird pictures. And so it's like this picture of this woman on a motorbike. I swear I didn't take this picture. There's a picture of storefronts, uh, Asian writing, I don't even know. Uh, it's all really industrial looking, kind of scary. And this was right when the Sony hacks happened, uh, when North Korea hacked into Sony. So I said, oh, you know what's happening? North Korea hacked my phone. That's it. All right, my phone is in uh, North Korea's control right now. Um, but it was like really cool. I was kind of getting this look inside this person's life, and it was a really good conversation starter when I went up to people. Um, but the weirdest thing about all these pictures was that there were dozens of pictures of this guy taking selfies with an orange tree. Like, super bizarre, like very serious selfies of him in oranges. Uh, and so I was like, what's going on? So then I talked to a friend of mine, I show him the pictures, and he goes, uh, did you lose a phone recently? And I said, like a long time ago. I can't even remember how long ago. And he said, well, you know most stolen iPhones end up in China. So I was like, boom, that's it. My cell phone's in China. Mystery solved. Sure enough, go to the Apple store the next day. My iCloud is still connected. So he was getting my pictures, and I was getting his pictures. So I left there, and I was like, OK, great, mystery solved. This is it. I felt like Scooby-Doo. This was the end of it. So then a little bit about me. Uh, I work at BuzzFeed. I've worked there for eight years. Uh, I started when uh, there was only 10 employees at the company. Uh, we worked in a rat-infested office in Chinatown. It was like pretty gross startup life. Um, but I got to do some really cool things. Uh, Oh, that's my phone in China. <laughs> um, I got to interview uh, Grumpy Cat, who you may know. I taught Madonna literally how to use a computer. Like, she didn't know what to do. She, like, sat there like that, and I had to, like, dictate what she was saying. Uh, I held, um, this is my proudest moment, I held a protest when Ryan Gosling wasn't voted the sexiest man alive by People Magazine. Bradley Cooper won that year, and it just didn't make sense. That was the year Drive came out, right? It was Ryan's year. Uh, and most recently, I've done the, the scariest thing I've ever done, which is I've gone to some Donald Trump rallies, and I've met uh, this man right here who has a literal Donald Trump tattoo, uh, an actual crazy person. <laughs> um, so one thing that's cool about BuzzFeed is that we've always given people freedom to write whatever they want. Whenever I, it's 
my job is the same as it was eight years ago as it is today. I go in and decide what I want to write about. So I was like, OK, sure, I'll, I'll write this story. People seem to be really interested in it. Um, so I wrote this story, who is this man and why are his pictures showing up on my phone? I published it, and I thought that was it. Uh, I go to bed that night, and it's like, on to the next story. But then I become famous. I wake up the next day, and there are all these tweets coming at me saying, oh my god, we're trying to help you find Orange Man. Uh, you, two and, you and him are meant to be. You, you need to see each other. I'm like, what is going on right now? Um, my name is the number one trending topic in China. <laughs> Like, it's all Chinese and then just my name. Uh, and I don't know if you guys know about China, but they have their own version of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, you name it, they have their own. So this was on Chinese Twitter, which is called Weibo. And sure enough, they found him. So it only took him like a day. They call the Chinese internet the human flesh search engine uh, because they can find anyone. And so they found him, and this was my first look at Brother Orange. So by now, the Chinese internet had named him Brother Orange. Brother in China is like a term of endearment in Orange because of the, the crazy selfies. So what happened next? They were like, OK, you guys need to start talking to each other. So I joined Chinese Twitter, Weibo, and we start exchanging messages. And he's like, oh, I can teach you how to use chopsticks. And I'm like, oh, it's cold in New York. Like We're just like having like very casual conversations. And then he invites me to go to China. So the Western perspective of China is uh, pretty much that everyone is supposed to be scared of China. Uh, everyone's kind of at war. I mean, look at that stock image. It's like terrifying. <laughs> um, that it's just kind of like a smog-filled country, that there's an inevitable war between countries in China. And then my friend Donald Trump, obviously, if you've seen this video where he's like, China, 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 in his like, annoying voice. Um, so I was like a little scared to go. I mean, that's what we're trained to, to feel about China, is that China is this big, scary, biggest country in the world. It's kind of scary there. But I was like, OK, uh, I can do this. I'm ready. Um, so I go to China. Uh, my plane ride. It's like 20 hours, and Brother Orange lives in a, a small Chinese city. And by small Chinese city, that means 4.5 million people, uh, which is bigger than Los Angeles. And uh, relatively, this place is unknown within China. I was in Beijing, and I was like, oh, I'm going to Meizhou. People were like, I've never heard of that place. I'm like, there's 4.5 million people there. How could you have not heard, it, heard of it before? But that's China. So I land in this airport, and I'm and nothing really happened on the plane, except this one girl came up to me. She was like a teenager. And she comes up, and she starts freaking out. Oh, my god, are you Matt? And I was like, what? You, you notice me? Like, how do you even know me? I've never been noticed before, ever. So I was, I was just like, oh, my god, this is crazy. This is weird, but whatever. Get off the plane, walk to the escalator. And that's kind of when everything changed. That's when uh, I was expecting to see Brother Orange's uncle right there, but that's not what I saw. I saw <laughs> tons of paparazzi, Brother Orange with the bouquet. What is going on right now? I mean, l l that's, look at my eyes. That's like, <laughs> I was not expecting any of this. This is after, also, no one should be photographed after like 20 hours of traveling. It's kind of rude. I was like, you got to give me a heads up next time. So this begins our adventure in China. So I kind of woke up every day in China. I had no idea what I was doing the next day, what was going on. I just kind of got in a car. We went to places like his restaurant, and we were followed by paparazzi. By the way, the cars we rode in had our faces on it. <laughs> like, what? We rode bikes. Uh, Notice a little baby orange in the carriage, so we kind of played that up. Uh, we like chip statues like I was like uh, some kind of like ambassador or something. It was very bizarre. I held babies. It was like I was part like presidential candidate, part Katy Perry. I was just like, what is my life right now? We had mud baths. This was my most awkward moment. I, uh, if you guys have ever been photographed by 20 like paparazzi while taking a mud bath before, it's kind of weird. <laughs> um, and we picked tea leaves. We saw these like really cool tea leaves. I was like, oh, this is where tea comes from. Uh, press conference. This was hilarious. I like went in and uh, 
Also, I love how they, uh, what did they, oh, you can't see, but they spelled his name wrong on his name cards. This is like boar orange. It's like, it was just really weird. It was so weird. And I wasn't expecting any of this to happen. We drank a lot. People put products in front of me and took my picture as if I would endorse them. I had to, someone took my phone and posted something on one of my Chinese social networks because I'm on all of them now. And someone was like, you need to delete that right now. That looks like a bad ad. This was what my life was like at this moment. And then I saw some really cool stuff. Um, this was like the five finger points, which is like this really beautiful area. Um, of course, we did the Titanic pose. And across this way, I really got to know this guy, Brother Orange. So I, I don't speak any Chinese, and Brother Orange doesn't speak any English at all. Um, we couldn't be more opposite of people. He's uh, from like rural China, and he is in his 40s, and he has four kids, which is crazy. He owns a restaurant, um, and he's never really done, he had never really left his town before. And then I'm like 28, dumb American, <laughs> like uh, works at BuzzFeed, uh, but we really got to know each other. Because what I say about friendship, like a friendship really is, if you think about it, just a series of shared experiences. And if you saw all those experiences we had, we got to know each other pretty quickly. We truly became a team. And like you can tell, like this guy's cool. Like, this is like literally this man that was thrust in the spotlight. Like, at least I had some experience when it was like, I, you write about people who go viral, but I'd never been the one that went viral, but then I went viral in China. So it was just really <laughs> bizarre. He's fun. Like, he's fun. Like, we were playing this up. Uh, just not what I was expecting at all. Took a selfie, of course, in front of the orange tree. <laughs> Um, which was cool. And uh, then everything kind of changed on the last day. So it was like we were all having fun. And then the last day, he made all of the photographers, all of the media go away because he really wanted to show me kind of his hometown. So went to his hometown. We, this is the tree that uh, he used to climb when he was a kid. And then we held a ceremony for his ancestors. So a little bit more about Brother Orange is that for the past few years, he's had a rough past few years. Uh, both of his parents have passed away. And he had kind of seen this whole thing as fate and destiny. People on the Chinese internet kept on saying that to me. They kept on saying, oh, you guys are meant to be. This is destiny. Um, and then Brother Orange kind of taught me about this idea of destiny. Destiny and fate is like a big value in Chinese culture. They really believe in, it's not really religious, it's just kind of in things are meant to be, they're put in order and they happen for a reason. So he told me at the ceremony that his parents had sent me to be his new brother after he passed away. So I was like, oh my God, you're gonna make me cry. This is like crazy. Um, like we actually, became like brothers then. And so the end of my trip in China ended like a movie. Like we were like crying on each other's shoulders. It was really bizarre and it's like kind of hard to under, it's even like, it's such a weird thing. Like this whole story is so weird. And he was standing at the, at the airport, like, uh, like Love Actually or something, like waving at the gate <laughs> and, until I couldn't see him anymore. And I was just like, what happened to me? And that's usually where I end this story. Um, but everyone always asks, well, what happened after? Um, and so I'll tell you what happened after. Uh, Brother Orange, of course, came to America. And so I kind of got to do the same thing that he did for me in China. So our journey started on The Ellen Show, <laughs> and, which was crazy. And he had never heard of Ellen before, and he was like, I don't know who this is, but uh, this is cool. And he was thrust, like he, we were literally on the stage of Ellen and this is a man who had obviously never left his country before, but never been anywhere. It was like truly brave of him. It was like really cool. And my favorite part of this whole thing was that I got to share with him stuff that I had uh, 
like I love. So when I was in China, I was eating snake. I was eating parts of pigs that I didn't know existed. And so when I when he was here, I was like, okay, this is my turn to make you eat what I want to eat. Uh, so I he had uh, my favorite thing, which is margaritas and chips and guacamole, which are now his new favorite thing, and which he told me that he's going to bring to his restaurant. So that's my impact right there. Um, and then he met my family, which was like really cool too. That he was able to do all of that stuff. And then he met my hero, Britney Spears, uh, which was really cool. We saw Britney Spears in Las Vegas. We met her backstage, and it was just—it was so cool to share. Kind of like he was able to share his life, and then I was able to share my life. And it's like really cool once you do that, like on a person-to-person -person level. Which brings me back to this whole thing, which frustrates me. And when I was talking with Brother Orange when he was in America, I was like, "Well, what do you think about Americans?" And he goes, "Oh, I think that Americans uh, were are really aggressive uh, because I see on the news all the time that you guys are in wars all the time." And I was like, "That's what you, you think we're like really like aggressive and mean because of what you see in the media?" And that's exactly what I thought about China, which is frustrating to begin with. And when you have idiots like this. Like, ooh, this, that's supposed to be a GIF. I want it to work. It's not working. That's supposed to be a GIF.、Um, spewing nonsense. It's just annoying because, in the end, what you should do is you should go to a country and actually meet the people. Because once you meet the people, it's the best way to actually get to know kind of what a country is like. And Maybe who knows? You can find your own brother orange there, and that's the end of my story. <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys.